chamber. By the time of Mr. Dalia, Mr. Chandrawal, all the excellencies and all the guests present here today. Thank you for inviting me to this uh, discussion. And I have been associate PhD chamber in the past. It was the Punjab Haryana Delhi chamber. And it's nice to see that it's grown much more and become an international chamber and not restrict only to the northern part of India. Also glad to see that they moved out of pure domestic constraints and domestic issues to the international issues of trade and development. Now we at IFT, of course, are probably the foremost institution, also a university. We deal with issues of trade. And as many of you probably know, we really have two disciplines, management and economics. And all these, both the disciplines largely cater to issues of international business. And uh, this is one of the first, I think, attempts that we try to go beyond just the academic world and partnered with an organization in looking at issues of trade and diplomacy. Now, we also do training programs in our executive management program for business houses. And these business houses, very often we find middle-level managers, those with five and more years of experience, who join our executive management programs. And these are meant to be a very important part of training today because today technology is moving so quickly, and I will soon take that to trade, that it's difficult to keep abreast of changes unless one keeps updating one's knowledge. And the EMP program of IFT is meant to be such, uh, both here in Delhi and in Calcutta branch of IFT, it is such as to train business mid-level managers as to changes which have happened ever since they had their last degree or discussion uh, or training program. So uh, we hope to further some more of these uh, programs. Now coming to the topic of this particular uh, conference and Mr. Anupadavan, our secretary, did refer to the issue of value chains and the issue of the need to diversify. Now, one of the themes which I'm glad that is being brought forward in this theme is the issue of that there are two other sp two sponsors are both Ministry of Commerce and Economic Diplomacy Division, and of course, uh, Commerce Ministry Associate in terms of uh, party. Because the reality is that it is interesting to me that non-economists seem to think that politics doesn't matter. Now that is a strange thing coming from me at least, because at least in economics you've always learned there can be no economics without politics, and frankly there can be no politics without economics. And this applies to the domestic level, it applies to the national level, so I'm glad you have combined and called it a session where you're looking at issues of economics and diplomacy. There are very few instances, even after the end of the Cold War 91, there are very few instances of two countries trading enormously among themselves, and yet having very limited or adverse diplomatic uh, relations. There are very few. Uh, you can see the current unraveling of the India-China relations for the same reason clear which way we are looking. So economics and diplomacy do tend to work together. And I'm very glad that these are combined themes. You cannot do one without the other. The next aspect to look forward, and you'll see this in these, I think it's a good idea that you're doing these area-wise studies. Because one of the things that has been happening since the 90s is that the multilateral trade negotiation framework has sort of frozen. Well, partly it is because of the session of 2008 and also because a lot of irreconcilable differences came up in the 19, uh, in the 2013 Cancun round. And now, of course, everything stalled because of the COVID and everyone made this COVID effect to go away. But one thing does happen, 
the mass happened in between the period 90s and now is that the world has gone beyond traditional WTO disciplines because the need of imperatives. And I'm going to mention two such imperatives. One is, as Mr. Padavan also mentioned, trade is becoming more regional. It always has been. For the simple reason that it is always makes sense. Markets are always segmented regionally. And we won't find the same product priced exactly, exactly the same in India and Brazil or India and US never happens. So markets are regional. They are connected by supply chains which are international, but the sales are generally regional. So you have a Toyota, uh, let's say uh, Malaysia, and you have Toyota India, and you have Toyota Brazil. They are the same overall management, but the strategies are different depending on economic and political issues of the various people. So it's good to start looking at regions because that is really where you have to begin. The next aspect which is worth looking at, and why regions are becoming important, is that while WTO did expand and make mandatory certain requirements of trade expansion globally, what it did not get into was the very contentious issue of trade and services because it left it as a positive list which really was something which countries need or need not actually get into. So both in the case of agriculture, where there is of course a, a kind of a limited agreement, and in the case of services, where the service agreement is such that you don't really have to commit on anything in trade and services, the WTO has been deficient. But in the reality, you tell me one trade that you do today which does not involve a service. You name one manufacturing product which does not have a service input. And the vice versa. Name a service input doesn't require a manufacturing product. What is a washing machine? Is the manufactured output? Or is it a service output? Does it require service inputs? And today, ITES, or what are called, uh, uh, if you want to call it, uh, trade in enabled services, international trade in uh, enabled services, IT enabled services information technology enabled services has become the most important, very difficult to categorize. And there are some attempts by OECD in the TIVA database and others trying to categorize. India, by the way, is the slowest in categorizing the data on uh, trading, uh, trading and services, very surprising. But the attempts at categorizing these trading services have shown that actually, if you try to look at what are called services embedded or service enabled trade. It's almost 50% of the world today. Now look at two factors which are true. Roughly about 70 to 75% of world trade is trade between companies. That means between subsidies of transnational companies. And transnational companies can be very small like the ones from Switzerland and Taiwan. So roughly about 75% of world trade is trade in uh, what you might have called uh, intimidated and trade also in uh, parts, components and services. And the other thing is roughly about 50% of world trade is in products which have what you might call the ITES product, information technology embodied services. The way things are going, very soon there will be no product which will not be called a service product, a service product not called a manufacturer product. This distinction is going to break down. Now that you have IoT, Internet of Things, the breakdown or distinction between manufacturing and services is going to create a big deal. Why is that important? Because the whole build up to the WTO in 95 was based on the premise that you have these three categories of products agriculture, industry, and services. And WTO is largely dealing with the second category WTO uh, industry manufactured goods, it was looking partially at agriculture and frankly in a very negative way at services. So the whole nature of trade has changed and as you know it is not countries who trade, it is companies who trade. Countries can only facilitate trade, they can't actually trade, it's only companies. So it's need to move beyond WTO disciplines and that's my second point I'm making, comes up in the 
emergence of regional trading arrangements or what WTO they call PTAs, preferential trading arrangements. Which is why almost all trade today is concentrated on some PTA or the other. Whether it is the big, the big guys, the USA, China, well, India at least geographically and number one is big. Or whether these small minions like, you know, what you want to call Belgium, Netherlands, a small country like Hong Kong, Singapore, everyone is getting into some regional trading arrangements. Professor Jagdish Bhakpati, of course, I'm sure you all heard of him, well known trade theorist, has talked about the spaghetti bowl of. Uh, there are so many, and I have looked at some, many at. Look at, look at the African countries. You lose track of who's having a trade agreement with who. We don't have that many in South Asia, but Africa and Latin America, Africa in particular, the African continent, is a complete, uh, I would say, a mess of RTAs. Everyone has a PTA with someone or the other. Some are pulled apart. <coughs> but there is one more aspect. I'm going to come back to the main theme of this. What this PTA is also doing, they're not only allowing you to go into areas beyond just manufacturers, but they're also allowing people to talk to others on other issues. If you want to call it diplomacy by other means. So this PTA is also diplomacy by other means. Now is that a good thing? Is it a bad thing? No, I don't want to comment on that. But it is diplomacy by other means. The difference between 90s and today in the post-COVID COVID is the economics is now beginning to dominate. It's beginning to difficult to sell anymore a PTA which is purely a diplomatic thing. You know, like SARC was a purely diplomatic piece. It had very little economic gains for India, but a very important, critical, I would say, part of India's diplomatic effort. So, keeping the link between the two, but recognizing that economics is dominant, is critical, but, and all, but still understanding that regions are getting more critical than the multilateral fora is what I would like to sort of try to point out. And let me end by saying that in this discussion, where does it leave India? And I'm going to again come back to the point I mentioned that the nature of trade has overtaken the nature of multilateral institutions like the WTO. And service is the one area. I think. Let me just give you one number and people keep saying, why do you keep harping on service? What about manufacturing? First of all, there's no such thing as manufacturing alone. And secondly, the services, discussing services, trade liberalization, discussing So let me end by saying, we in India are very deficient in our capitalization of, of services. The WTO has been able to capitalize their trade in services just like you do for manufacturers. So has the OECD. But India is very deficient and I don't know why. Look at the following fact. After 65, 70 years of trade, India reached roughly about, little about a little over 1 or 2 percent of world trade manufacturing. After barely two decades of trading services, India's share is roughly about 4% in trading IT levels. And you are not in the world for yourself. Good or bad is not the point. Point is that avenues have changed. Uh, last, last, last point. Last point that we end. The last issue is the following. As you are going forward, and you're looking at trade and diplomacy as two related things, that's a good thing. You're also looking at regions, that's also the way the world is going to go. But the third thing which we in India have to break our link from the past is not to keep harping on the fact that the only thing we can export are labor intensity. Technology is a critical component. Let me not get into this, but all empirical studies show that the most important determinant of a trade is not what you might think the source of labor, the technology. Again, no value judgment. Whether you like it or not, technology replaces all natural resources. The Middle East is finding out now to their own Technology replaces resources. Technology also replaces human beings. 
So for the companies out there, do try to think, where do we go forward, where the same technology conference is critical to our trade effort, yet we have to worry about what happens to those who are unemployed because of the large I think with these uh, few words, let me again commend to the House for the wonderful work in organizing this conference. Thank you.